Good to see everybody this evening. Uh, we still have several classes to go, and so I'm glad. I appreciate your uh, attendance and your support in doing this class on social media. Uh, we are talking about something we've made reference to several times, and I've been, I've been anxiously awaiting this class. Uh, because there's some very interesting things that go along with it. We're going to be talking tonight about mental health and social media. There's some really interesting science out there that says that social media has an adverse effect upon your mental health, which is ironic because a lot of people go to social media in order to feel better. Studies show that the exact opposite is happening. That's why this lesson is entitled when the treatment is worse than the disease. If you're going to try to feel encouraged or you're depressed and you want to feel better, the science says social media is not the right place to go. Let's talk about some of these numbers. I mentioned this before, a statement made by Gene Twingy in an excellent article I encourage you to read called Have Smartphones Destroyed a Generation? You can find it online at The Atlantic. Uh, Twingy says that Generation Z, that's that generation we talk so much about in the introduction of this lesson, that the smartphone natives, if you want to look at them that way, they're on the brink of the worst mental health crisis in decades. And not all of it is because of social media, but social media does play a factor in it. And here's some of the statistics. One hour a day, now this is from a scientific journal, one hour a day on social networks reduces satisfaction with overall life by 14%, that's a significant number, 14% of your satisfaction overall life can be uh, damaged in just one hour. And most people are spending more than one hour a day on social media. All screen activities are linked with less happiness. And all non-screen activities are linked with more happiness. So that's a very clear-cut statistic as well. Another thing that has been found is that eighth graders who spend 10 or more hours a week on social media are 56% more likely to say that they are unhappy. Now, corresponding to that, eighth graders who spend an above average time with friends, that's not online, but in person, flesh and blood contact, are 20% less likely to say that they are unhappy. All of this is stacking up to give the same, the same idea, which is this, that social media is bad medicine. The treatment is worse than the disease. If you go on there trying to feel better, it's actually going to make you feel worse. It's not the place to go to find happiness or fulfillment. Now, sociologists, scientists have been trying to figure this out. And uh, I've read some research papers, some journals, scientific journals, just some columns and, and other sources as well, and been looking at reasons for this, and they come down to four things, four factors underlying, underlying all of this, and it doesn't have to do, interestingly enough, with friendships or loneliness. Uh, the, the stats say that social media does keep you connected with friends, as you would expect, and it does kind of help you deal with loneliness, so it's not that. It's not that it pushes you away from friends or that you feel more lonely on social media. There are deeper underlying factors that are, that are creating all this unhappiness. And we're closing in on it. I don't know if we've figured everything out yet, but we're starting to close in on it. I'm going to look at four of them in particular. Now, the first one is envy. Envy. Uh, envy occurs when you get on and you start comparing yourself with others. Now, long before social media, long before computers, before technology, the Apostle Paul said that those who measure themselves by themselves or compare themselves with themselves are not wise. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. It's not wise to do that. And we talked about that in the devotional just a minute ago. Everybody's different. Everybody's been made special. And we tend, to, uh, we tend to diminish our own strengths and, and highlight our weaknesses 
and highlight other people's strengths and diminish their weaknesses. And so we're not fair judges of ourselves when we put ourselves in this, this competition. Now, that was a problem when Paul was writing, which was before computers and before the internet, before online connectivity, when there was a limit to how many comparisons you could make in a day. Think about it now. Just by scrolling with your finger on your smartphone over you know, just a few minutes' time, you can make hundreds of comparisons between yourself and others, which creates and generates a lot of envy and jealousy, a tremendous amount of that. And I don't have to tell you, envy makes you very, very unhappy, right? Um, one example of this is in Ovid's tale, uh, Metamorphoses, uh, the tale of Minerva's visit to the house of envy. Envy is like this monster, the grossest monster you can think of. When uh, Minerva, who's like this princess, comes to the house of envy, she catches envy eating poisonous snakes. So that's about the grossest thing that I can imagine, eating poisonous snakes. So envy's uh, reaction to the sight of Minerva is a great description of what the abstract sense of envy does. And I'm, I'm going to read this and see if you can soak it in. It's pretty, uh, Ovid's pretty deep in, in his description, but the last line in particular really drives it home. Stiff, this is a description of envy. Stiffly she advances, and when she sees the beauty of the golden, of the goddess, and of her armor, she cannot help but groan, and makes a face, and sighs a wretched sigh. Then she grows pale, and her body shrivels up. Her glance is sidewise, and her teeth are black. Venom from her dinner coats her tongue. She only smiles at sight of another's grief. Nor does she know, disturbed by wakeful cares, the benefits of slumber. When she beholds another's joy, she falls into decay and rips down only to be ripped apart. And then this part, I really want you to hear. Herself, the punishment for being her. That's envy. It's its own punishment. Your punishment for being envious is being envious. And... I think that just caps it off right there. That's why it's so dangerous, such a problem. A great example in the Old Testament of the self-destruction of envy is King Saul. Uh, king Saul had the honor of being the first king of the Israelite monarchy. He was anointed by Samuel, and he was a head taller than everybody, very impressive-looking guy, and won some battles in the name of the Lord, but was generally very disappointing to God in the end. So David was anointed to be king in his place. David kills Goliath, and the women begin singing this song in 1 Samuel chapter 18. Uh, Saul has killed his thousands, and David has killed what? His ten thousands. And David's just this young man, and he's getting all the praise and accolades, and is driving Saul crazy. And if you look at 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 9, you have the perfect description of envy. It says, Saul kept an eye on David from that day on. He kept an eye on him. Another translation says, Saul kept eyeing David. And what's really interesting to me about that is the English word envy, in the etymology of the word, is related to the word for eye. So when you envy, your eyes are focused on the other person. And like I said before, you have a twisted view of that other person. You see only their, their successes and their strengths, and you're blind to their imperfections and weaknesses and flaws that everybody has. Uh, envy is very dangerous. Uh, envy is listed among the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. And what's really interesting, all of the vices listed there have some form of of temporary pleasure. They're sinful, so they all lead to misery in the end. But all of them, except for envy, have some form of temporary pleasure. Only envy is miserable from the start. It's like Ovid says, herself the punishment for being her. So envy is alive and well on social media because 
of all the potential for comparisons that exist there. And this isn't just biblical conclusions being drawn. Sociologists have found that envy is a big part of what's making people unhappy on, on social media. Now, here's the second factor. First, you have envy. Second, there's guilt. And this is related to another study that we had early on when we talked about time. So we've already gone over how much time is spent on worthless things on, on the Internet, on YouTube, on on social media, wherever, Facebook, Twitter. You can spend a lot of time and not realize it till after you're done. And so what happens is when you spend all that time on the computer or your phone, you're not spending time on things that make you feel good and better yourself. Uh, studying your Bible, getting some exercise, spending time with friends, uh, you know, just taking care of some some errands or responsibilities that you need to take care of, catching up on work, uh, relaxing your mind, stuff like that. You're not doing those things while you're on social media. And then whenever you pull away, finally, you realize how much time has passed and what sets in, the guilt. You just feel horrible about yourself after all of that. And uh, you, just, you just hate that. So it's depressing. It's it's uh, the time spent on worthless things. That's another thing that, that scientists have found is causing this general feeling of unhappiness. And here's the next factor. The next un underlying factor is victimization. The longer you spend in uh, the social media environment, the longer you are uh, exposed to bullies and trolls and critics and people that just really <coughs> are out to get you. And there's something, we've already talked about this, something about social networking online depletes empathy for other people. Something about mediating your conversations through a computer screen makes you forget there's a real living human being with a soul on the other end. And so what happens is we're not as nice to one another online as we are in real life. We're not as forgiving to one another online. We're more critical online. And this is just a fact. So what that means is there's more bullies online than there are in real life. Now, if you were on your way to school as a kid and, and you walked to school like kids used to do, or like me and my brothers, you rode your bicycle to school, and there was a bully on the same street corner on your route to school every day, after a while, you'd get smart and take a detour around the bully, right? You wouldn't go by the street corner. you just avoid him and go another way. Well, the same concept is true online. If you get bullied on Facebook, quit going on Facebook. If there are certain people that are critical and just make you feel bad, unfollow them or block them. You can do these things. But get them out of your environment. Because this is something that is really, really harmful. I just read a tragic story. I didn't have time to read all the details of it. I just skimmed it in AL.com about a nine-year-old girl who took her own life because of being bullied. I, I, I don't even understand how a nine-year-old girl would even think to do that. This is the world we're living in now. Because our kids, in some ways, are growing up too fast. In other ways, they're growing up too slow. Victimization. Okay, negativity. Now this is one I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try really hard to, I'm just learning this myself, just trying to understand this. But uh, I'm going to try to explain it and please ask for clarification if this doesn't make any sense. But there is a business model behind social media. Okay, Facebook is uh, traded on the start, stock market. It's a, it's a publicly traded stock. It's a business. They make lots of money. And you're not, as a user with an account on Facebook, you're not the customer, okay? You're a user. So you get on and you use it, but the customers are firms, campaigns, businesses, organizations that are buying your personal information. That's what's going on. Now, how do they get your personal information? 
by getting you to engage in Facebook. Okay, so what gets you to engage more? Positive news, good news, or negative news, bad news? What causes you to engage more, make more comments, click more, scroll more, interact more? Which one? Negative. Bad news, negative news, negative emotions. So the system is designed to amplify negative emotions because that's where the money is. It gets you to engage more. The more you engage, the more information you reveal about yourself, the more information you reveal about yourself, the more valuable Facebook is to the firms, campaigns, politicians, organizations, and businesses that do business with them. You're the user giving your information away for free, and they are the customer, and you don't know really who they are, but there's a system here. There are algorithms that are top secret. Okay, you don't see WikiLeaks leaking Google's analytic uh, algorithms or Facebook's algorithms. They can't get a hold of them, although they can get top secret political information about governments. This stuff is highly protected because, and this isn't a conspiracy theory, it's just the way it works. It, it makes a lot of money. It generates a lot of money. Um, Facebook has come under a lot of scrutiny this year over this kind of stuff. And maybe you heard about Cambridge Analytica. You might write that down look that up if you want to know more about this. Um, of course, they're still trying to figure out how the Russians used uh, uh, social media during the 2016 election and this past election. Still trying to infiltrate things and manipulate Americans and influence elections. We don't know to what extent they were successful. That's the thing about this is you, you can't really put your finger on what's happening. But, um, but this stuff is going on. We don't need to be naive about it. And it's another reason why you feel bad. The whole system is geared towards making you feel bad because then you'll engage more. Mark. Yes. Yeah, they're they're trying to predict your behavior because then they can sell that those predictions to advertisers, and they can know oh this guy's about to this family's about to have a baby. I've seen examples of this. These people are about to have a baby, or they're about to enroll their kid in school. They're about to go looking for a car, and then all of a sudden your news feed there are ads about those kinds of things. Um, that's that's real. That's happening, and uh, you know you just kind of decide to overlook that if you want to engage in this stuff. And I'm not saying not not use Facebook. I'm just saying know what you're dealing with when you're when you're on there. Well, it's not just happening. You know, we think about it and we think, well, we're in a small town of Leeds or Moody. It's not happening here. Yeah. But I, last year I got what's called a geospatial marketing report on this whole area, and the whole report is based off of Facebook and Google. People are signed in, and it gives us how many years, how much money you're spending on groceries, how much money you're spending on health care, and it doesn't give necessarily names, but it gives regional ideas. I'm sure that some of these bigger companies can get down into it, and it's amazing that you pull the zip code and see how many people spent money going to the movies, mm -hmm. and it's all from people tagging, posting, and yeah. companies use that to market, um, to market those those entities, those people. Right. And it's happening. I mean, that, if I can pull that report as a very, very small business, you can imagine what these larger businesses can do with information that we're freely giving them into the marketplace. Yeah. And does everybody understand the tie-in to what Jason's saying and negative emotions? They've got to get you to engage, and negativity draws engagement more than positive, feel-good things. Uh, yeah, Mark. It's gotten so bad now. There was a guy that did a study. He didn't log on to anything on his phone. He just sat his phone down and said, I'm about to get a dog. And then he started getting ads for dog toys, dog food. Never typed or said anything into that phone. Just set it in front of him. Because 
because they're listening all the time. Well, maybe I'll get some feedback from them you about this class. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mindy, did you want to say something? I was going to add to Jason, just being a mid, uh, company as a bank. Um, we we have one person that that's all they can handle is our social media account, and they they gather the data and tell us what areas are weak and what products we need to sell uh, sell in that particular area, just based off of the same data that they use. See, those are customers, and you're a user, and it's two different things. And you thought you were getting that for free, but you're not. You're selling your own personal information. True. Oh, yes. my, uh, I haven't changed my status as a widow or anything, but it wasn't long after Ricky died that I kept getting these random friend requests from Afghanistan and Iran and California, everywhere. Men, everywhere. And I never changed anything. I just have to delete all that. Yeah. It's just, I just don't it, think we realize how much control we're losing. Right. Um, now, I don't know how to respond to Mark's example, but I was going to say, if this is freaking you out, just delete all your social media accounts. But apparently that's not going to work either. So. Android phone or iPhone or Apple, they're listening to you all the time. You got, I mean, they've even said that Google knows your location, even though you've got your location turned off on your phone. Oh boy, this is scaring me, and I, I came up with this. Okay, what about a? Let's let's talk about a cure. If Facebook's, if if social media is not the place you go to, to find fulfillment and feel better, is there a cure? What do you do? What do you do? And the answer is, you choose happiness. Now, that sounds to some people like an impossibility because. They think of happiness as an emotion. How do I choose happiness? But look at some of these scriptures that command joy. We'll run through them really quickly. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Zechariah 9, 9. Psalm 101. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Matthew 5, 12. Rejoice and be glad. And this is after he said, Blessed are those who are persecuted. So to the persecuted, he says... Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Uh, Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice. Um, Philippians 4, 4, everybody knows this one. Rejoice the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, rejoice always. And rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13. So happiness can be chosen. It's choice. Now I want to, I want to balance that out a little bit, okay? Because I think some people get the wrong idea, and they think that we are just talking about a fleeting emotion, and saying that it's wrong to be unhappy, or it's wrong to grieve, or something like that. And you'd be surprised at the people who make those kind of comments. Um, <clears throat> are there ever any circumstances in which you have the right to be unhappy? Of course there are. There have to be. There have to be. But you'd be surprised at the church leaders. Actually, you probably wouldn't be surprised because we've all heard these comments. You'd be surprised at the teachers, church leaders, parents, influencers who say it's wrong to feel bad sometimes. I saw this and I, I see these examples all the time on social media, of course. I scratch it. I know it looks a little frantic there. Maybe that, maybe that was a subconscious scratching out, but scratch his face and his name out because you probably would recognize this preacher if you, if you saw his name or his picture. But look at this tweet that he, he put out there. I see a lot of people who are unhappy, but can't seem to figure out why they're so unhappy. I'm convinced that oftentimes it's because they aren't doing what they know they need to be doing. You can't, both, you can't be both fulfilled and derelict at the same time. Well, that sounds to me, and I know he has the word oftentimes to get him out of trouble there, but it sounds like he's saying, if I'm unhappy, I'm derelict. If I'm unhappy, it's because I am not, quote, doing what I know I need to be doing. That just got all over me because I think there are lots of reasons, legitimate reasons for people to grieve or be unhappy or not feel good. 
life is hard, right? So before I get into choosing happiness, let's understand what I mean when I say happiness. It's always, it's always important to define our terms, okay? And happiness here is not an emotion. When the Bible says choose happiness or rejoice as a command, it's not talking about waking up and being in high spirits without any kind of explanation. It's not forbidding grief, and it's not saying there aren't times where you shouldn't be concerned or heavy-hearted. Right? All, all of that is natural and important. And I also, I'm running out of time, but there's also another element here of clinical depression, which is a totally different thing from this. Okay, if somebody's dealing with a chemical imbalance that causes anxiety or depression in their lives, they, they need to seek medical treatment they don't need to just will themselves over it. You're, you can't do that, okay? But I think if we understand what is, what's being commanded here and what's being promised, then we can start making this choice and finding fulfillment outside of social media, finding in the, in the right place, which is God. So here are some of the ways that this, this fulfillment, this joy, is described in Scripture. Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not want for anything that I need. Okay, it's not I shall not want anything. I shall not want for those things, particularly spiritual necessities in my life. I, I'll be given all that I need. The Lord will make me sufficient to be his vessel, to live according to his will. Another way that it's described, and I wish we had time to go over these passages, but I'm just, just out of time here. Contentment. Now, this word contentment, the way that it's used, it describes a self-sufficiency. But not a self-sufficiency depending on your own strength. It's a self-sufficiency that's given to you by God. So God gives you, by His grace, the strength that you need to... to be content and to uh, not be controlled by the circumstances around you. And this isn't something that it just comes to you naturally. Paul says, if you want to add another reference to this, Philippians 4.11, I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content in that situation. And later he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Another way that it's described is blessed or blessed. Uh, that's the Beatitudes. Uh, Psalm 1, it's Revelation 14, 13, blessed. And if you think that just means high spirits and good positive emotions, look at the Beatitudes of Christ. And every one of them says, blessed is the man who, blessed is this person, and then explains what he means by blessed. I'm just going to read through the explanations really quickly here, and you'll see this isn't just some fleeting emotion. Um, Matthew 5, 3 and 10, the kingdom of heaven, that's blessed. Uh, Matthew 5, 4, comforted. Well, comforted assumes that you're in pain, right? You can't be comforted if you're not first uncomfortable. Uh, verse 5, inherit the earth, meaning you don't have it to begin with. Verse 6, <clears throat> satisfied. You're not satisfied. You can't be satisfied unless you're first thirsty and hungry. Uh, verse 7, receive mercy. Who needs mercy but those who are in trouble, right? Verse 8, they shall see God. Verse 9, they shall be called sons of God. That's what blessed means. Blessed means fortunate or it can mean happy, but this isn't just some fleeting emotion here. This is deep stuff we're talking about. An underlying calm, a fulfillment that can withstand even the hardest things. And here's one last description, joy. Now, I want to look at 1 Peter 1.8 in connection with joy. I think it's one of the best passages on joy and one of the most overlooked passages on joy. And I'm rushing. I apologize for that. Let's get this in here before the bell rings or before you leave because I think the bell's going to catch me. Um, here's 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice 
Now he's going to describe it with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Now, when you read that, do you feel like you've just kind of come up short? Joy inexpressible and filled with glory. I don't have that kind of joy. What do those two descriptives of joy mean? What does the word inexpressible mean? Does it mean cartwheels down the aisle and a smile on your face all the time and laughing all the time and being cheerful? No, it means inexpressible. It's impossible to express what he's talking about here. So it's not external. A lot of that stuff has to do with your personality and the culture that you've been brought up in. Uh, traveling around the world, you'll notice that people express joy in different ways. Americans are a lot more open and um, external in their expressions than people in the rest of the world. And uh, that just goes to show you right there that he's not talking about just something external. Besides that, you can fake external stuff. This is something that is true. And then he says, filled with glory, meaning it doesn't come from around here. It doesn't come from your circumstances. It comes from heaven. It's given by grace. And so that's the joy we're talking about here. It's something deep and abiding and something that we don't take for granted. So joy in Christ is this satisfaction and peace in the love of God. And that's where fulfillment and happiness comes from. That's the good medicine. Social media is not going to give it to you. It's geared to make you feel bad. But God sent his son Jesus so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. All right, thanks for your attention tonight.